Okay, um, first, uh, my name is Roderick Kuva, and I am the media artist and director of the project The Key to Time. And I'm joined in this session by composer Krzysztof Wolek, who uh, uh, com collaborated me with, on this project, and Eva Wojtovich, uh, who will be serving as the discussant. I'd also like to thank the AC Institute for this opportunity to share our work and uh, also the Adam Miskovich Institute, who provided a significant part of the funding for the project to their initiative, Plus 100, bringing together collaborators from uh, different countries with Polish artists. The Key to Time is a cinematic artwork that was made for large format VR settings like 360 cinemas, domes, and planetariums. And we've also shown it with headsets, like you see there, in uh, cinema settings. It's a surreal and lyrical experience that follows dreamlike adventures of a scientist who's thrown into the future due to an experiment gone wrong and finds himself at sort of the end of time. The world is in collapse and his only hope is to just travel back in time, to travel back through dreams. Um, the Key to Time was created collaboratively with Christoph and myself, exchanging sound and images throughout the creative process. It was filmed in a green screen studio at Seta Studios in uh, Wroclaw in Poland, which is um, uh, a wonderful large green screen space. And we had actors from TR Theater in Warsaw and vocalists from both Warsaw and Louisville, Kentucky. The project layers action recorded on the green screen settings with those images that I created uh, filming in industrial settings around Poland, the UK and the US and created settings designed in Blender. All of this is Im imagined as blending, combining together to create fabulous, strange, dreamlike worlds. At every moment, you don't know what may come next where the doors may lead, it's a world of surprise. Uh, the Key to Time in its full length is 45 minutes long. And also we've made a number of shorter uh, segments for uh, VR viewing. And later on in the talk, we'll be providing the uh, link to view one of these works, whether you like to view it in 2D or if you have a headset available, you can look at it in uh, its 360 VR format. Today, um, that'll be, be at the end of our talk. We're gonna start with a brief synopsis of the uh, full film. So you get an idea of the kind of images and the way the story goes. And I'll kind of lead you through that. Then I'll uh, hand it over to Eva Vodovich, who will lead the discussion. And uh, then we'll end with the screening of the work. So the key to time starts off in a strange, dreamy underworld, underwater world, filmed underwater. And it, um, soon we find ourselves drifting downward in this immersive space into this laboratory where the young Tanek is imagining worlds beyond, looking up at the skies and trying to project himself into this fabulous future. And equally into a fabulous past. He travels back as if into the world of silent cinema, a world of the images of the surreal and expressionism. And the movie in, our, in all around in its 360 world moves back and forth between a contemporary world of color and a world of black and white. Back in the lab, Tannock makes contact with Anna through his time travel device. He can't yet move through it, but he can reach out and speak through time. She fades away, telling him to meet him at the station, if only he could. He must travel through dreams, which is what, she, what he does, travel across the flooded zones, imagine him, himself crossing the planets. Another dream occurs, a remembrance, 
an accidental journey of love, created in a uh, early cinema style. Anna arrives at uh, Tanek's laboratory where he has just invented this wonderful device. She is amazed by it, drawn by it. Something remarkable happens. Something about her hand, perhaps, a remarkable arm, creates a flame, an ignition, and Tanek disappears into the object, falling away from her as if forever into the darkness. He is dreaming again. Now he's inside the clock, these huge clock devices that twist and turn as he moves be between small scale and large scale devices. Anna calls to him to meet, him, meet her at the station. If only he could, if there's only time. Tanek, you see, is always late, late, always late. For example, the story of Anna's hand, another silent film sequence. Tanek is uh, with his uh, foster father in a laboratory. Anna comes to see, uh, see the lab and to see Tanek. Tanek and Anna, not real siblings, illicit love. The father isn't too happy about this, unhappy about Tanek's distraction, unhappy about what's going on between Tanek and his daughter. And one moment when Tanek is late for an experiment, he grabs Anna and says, well, I'll use you for my experiments. Try this. His rage is out of control and leads to disaster. Anna's hand has been blown off in the experiment. Anna, he says, I'll make you a hand better than the one you ever had. And he crafts a hand, a very special hand. Next, Anna's at the station, waiting for Tanek. Late, always late. By the time Tanek arrives, Anna seems to be with another man, a man who looks an awful, like, an awful lot like Tanek, a doppelganger. Or has Tanek arrived in some parallel universe? He follows the doppelganger ganger into the city streets. We arrive into the doppelganger's world, and this uh, launches a doppelganger's song, a song of power, a ruthless power in an, in an post-apocalyptic age. The piece is driven by all these different songs. Um, it's kind of had an op operatic concept to it. And um, so these st songs string through the story while the voices are given is uh, voiceovers um, to the action. Kind of a mix of radio drama and opera and film. Anik as a young child was locked in a closet. Perhaps it's there that he developed his capacity to travel through dreams. He sings about that in a song called The Key to Time. Suddenly we're inside a clock. Now another song is playing. It's a time song, as if you're stuck inside a speaking clock gone wrong. Language becomes messed up and distorted. Uh, Tanex searches uh, desperately for his Anna. Anna now appearing inside a zoetrope, spinning around him. Everything is spinning. She's inside the clock. The pendulum comes smashing toward viewers. She's with her lover out on the marshes. Tanek, furious, chases, imagines the chasing down of the father, the father shop. They spiral into tunnels. He's chasing the topo, doppelganger and Anna through a maze of tunnels. This maze of tunnels actually uh, filmed in old Nazi tunnels on the Polish-German border. Suddenly they're in an oasis. A fabulous song is being sung, a song based on uh, Prometheus Unbound. His, uh, Tanek's image is broadcast on, on the screen above the performer as are the images of all the people in, the, in this strange bar. The singer sings of the resistance. And as she sings, uh, there is a great explosion and all flee into the marshes. There Anna discovers the power of her hand. She takes off a glove and lets her hand lead the way and leads her back to this bunker. All converge in the bunker for the finale of the uh, film. And we are thrown through a fabulous wormhole-like space, deep, deep through this channel, which is pretty cool in, in, in uh, VR, in uh, 3D. It's all uh, created in 8K, and it's a 
pretty intense ride. Suddenly there's a train whisping through the tunnel and we find ourselves uh, at last on an empty station. So this gives a bit of an overview of uh, the story of the film, what the full 45 minute experience would be. As I said, the work is designed for especially large formats. We've shown it in uh, spaces like planetariums and domes. And um, as after the discussion, I will be posting a link to look at a 10 minute segment called Meet Me at the Station, which is, uh, follows the time song, which is uh, based on lyrics by Deb Olin Unferth. And with that, I am going to exit from my screen share and open this up to discussion led by Eva Vojtovic. All right. Eva? <clears throat> Thank you so much. Good evening and good afternoon, actually, uh, to both parts in Europe and the US. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, let me start the discussion from a very simple question to first to Rod, then to Krzysztof. How was actually the creative collaboration between both of you? Could you tell us a bit more about the process? Uh, yes, great. The, um, the project began, I had, was visiting uh, Warsaw uh, at the invitation of the uh, Adam Miskita Institute, uh, meeting artists there, meeting, um, uh, uh, visiting different institutions, and they suggested the idea of developing this project as one of several projects in what became the Plus 100 initiative. Uh, works in trying to envision a new language of the avant-garde in an age of emerging media. And um, I was involved, I, I participated in kind of thinking, well, how would such an initiative take shape and propose that international collaboration be at the heart of this? And then I reached out to Kristoff, uh, whose music I was introduced to. Kristoff uh, lives in Louisville and suggested we start a process, a very open-ended process, that would be truly collaborative in the very beginning. Um, and so well, at that point, I think, Christoph, I can throw it open to you. I, know I sent Christoph some initial ideas. We wanted a structure that was, had a kind of initially a combinatory way of working, because I've been doing a lot of combinatory work, and I've done other VR projects that were combinatory. So we started in a way of things moving this way and that, this way and that. We had a kind of spinning notion, a notion of combining elements. And the way the story took shape, it ended up becoming a kind of a more straight structure with these different offshoot shorter pieces that, that kind of fit in and can work in different areas. Yeah, so uh, when uh, Rod contacted me first, uh, it was, uh, of course, the process started to of learning who you're working with. and. Uh, uh, learning the work that he's doing, I realized that he's very interested in the work in the environmental uh, area and uh, trying to use art to bring up the uh, problems of the uh, of the uh, of our world today and how we as artists can address it. And then um, once we s saw that we are interested in each other works. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Rod pitched to me the story, which is um, from even from his description, you can see that's quite a complicated story. Uh, so, uh, in order to really process it, we we started to exchange the ideas: which section should go at which place, what uh, place, what's the pacing of the project, uh, how music could influence the images. This is uh, something that is uh, a little bit different uh, in the uh, independent project that you would see in uh, uh, blockbuster movies in that uh, music, in this case, music is part of the creative process. It's not something that is brought uh, after after the film was shot. Uh, and it influences the, sh the, the pacing, taking into consideration the format in which film is presented. Uh, uh, we we are talking about uh, one format being VR, which is completely different than showing it in, in large scale planetarium. So we have versions of the project which can be shown in different uh, uh, venues, and it, they are slightly adjusted in terms of how things uh, progress from one scene to another. Um, after after this initial work on the uh, on this uh, screenplay. Um, then uh, we brought the artists into the project. We recorded the voices of the 
uh, of the project with artists from Louisville, from the School of Music, uh, uh, and uh, later on we recorded the uh, the actors in uh, in Poland. So it all was constantly exchanging the information, uh, which is. Uh, uh, going to this idea of traveling through time, traveling through te through uh, through spaces, and uh, and creating something that is not following a standard timeline that you would see in a movie. It's kind of uh, uh, throwing you off, and it's like traveling constantly through uh, through uh, dream space uh, without really being rooted in one place and time. And that's an interesting right. element that we actually recorded the voices before we did the filming. And then we went back and re-recorded. So we had this separation, this junction between language and image going from the beginning, which allowed us to move between silent film and new media and between music and standard voice. And it created a very interesting space for us to work in. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Uh, may I ask about this retro aesthetics you have applied to some parts of the project? the silent movies from the avant-garde and of course from the beginning of the cinema and uh, some spaces or worlds taken like from post-apocalyptic images of contemporary art. What was the idea behind, uh, you know, joining those two aesthetics together? Yeah, that's really, uh, there's a few different things going on with that. One was that, um, I wanted to make some kind of bridge between this uh, late 19th, early 20th century concept of the optical unconsciousness tied to the industrial revolution and what the imag digital imaginary is, how these worlds that we live in are constructed through our media. And in, that's so many of the problems also that we live with today, particularly with, we say, with climate change, are grounded in the language of the industrial revolution. And you don't break up our situation just by the science, you have to transform the paradigms. And to do that, you have to get into the level of language and structure and, and how these forces of technology work together. So I wanted to those to bounce, to have some kind of play with them. And the songs we created have a lot of play between uh, different kinds of technology and that we would move through the film use in uh, the, the speaking clock, which used to have used to be a thing you'd have on telephones. You could call up on the telephone and listen to the clock. They don't have those, I don't think, too much anymore. Um, and we have uh, old, uh, we have zoetropes, you're caught inside a zoetrope, Anna's caught in a zoetrope spinning around, multiplying as she goes. Um, and then we have these images, NASA images that, that we created into these 360 uh, experiences for the domes. So you're bouncing back and forth across time and the technology is a trigger for that. And it also allows us for this uh, to, to engage language by moving between silent film and the new media and break up this thing I'm not very interested in, which is this, uh, you know, the verisimilitude of VR, which uh, one has to work against to show, to, to take us back into a kind of a deeper consciousness or a dream experience of it. So try the different, using old cinema to do that, uh, to, it's um, to kind of show there's a breakdown between the uh, inner world and the outer world. Um, I wish like like the way that say the theater director Richard Foreman always has this chaos on the inside parallels a chaos on the outside or Bergman does in Shame or all of Guy Madden's films do this and so we're really trying to work on that play and this shifting me these uh, technologies also create help I hope create that experience and I think right. the sound too we had a lot of play like that yeah I think there's a lot of uh, elements both in film and the music that. Uh, uh, try to imitate the old technology, although we are using, of course, very new de technology. But uh, the you know the sound processing, for example, is not particularly complicated. We are trying to use multi-layering in order to create certain visual aesthetics. Uh, I mean the uh, um, audible uh, uh, aesthetic uh, of the beginnings of the electronic sounds. Uh, and with the image too. I mean the black and white movies uh, uh, were supposed to bring up the. 1920s uh, uh, and film experiences from the time, while at the same time uh, traveling from uh, through wormhole is uh, uh, a feature of uh, many great uh, uh, sci-fi films that uh, 
you know, show us traveling to different worlds. So it's, uh, I think a lot of it also tries to create certain continuity of uh, and pinpoint us that we are in certain present, but we are not isolated, right? We came from somewhere and we are living the consequences of what happened uh, during the 20s and then during the war. And then what we are do do doing is going to project what's going to happen in the future. And we have a huge responsibility to take care of our environment, uh, not only a uh, physical environment, but in general of, of, uh, of our surroundings in order to create the world that is uh, 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 inhabitable. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Yes, exactly. A lot of them layers, both uh, in terms of images and of course in terms of ideas can be visible when you make yourself familiar with the project as I had a chance. And uh, may I also ask about the songs, about the soundtracks. Uh, how did you choose those particular sounds to accompany the images? There are, there are a couple of, uh, of course, uh, decisions that need to be uh, made uh, uh, at the start of the project. First of all, what's the role of the music? Uh, is it uh, only the supportive role or do you want it to be more creative role? Uh, certainly in film, uh, you want to support the atmos atmosphere of what's happening in the images and kind of uh, support the, the story. Uh, in this circumstance, it was great because uh, uh, wrote very much allowed the music to shape uh, the pacing of the film. So if uh, I felt that uh, um, that uh, we needed to uh, uh, finish certain uh, phrase and finish some kind of uh, uh, musical idea, Rod would allow the film to extend a little bit or make it shorter in order to accommodate that. That's one thing. Second thing is that there's a few uh, songs that are sung in the um, in the story uh, in the story in the film that have essential role. Uh, the, one of the main points of the film is where um, where uh, there is a scene on the ground where this, there's this person singing a, a solo voice for four minutes in the film, which of course relates also to other films. Uh, you can bring up. Uh, uh, Mulholland Drive, for example, because there's a very important. You certainly had that in, in mind that, you know, this, to create these references, not only visual, but also the audio references. And uh, uh, I think that the songs also uh, are supposed to create kind of, kind of unsettling uh, mood for the, uh, for the film. Um, there are some other elements that, uh, uh, that uh, bring out the, you know, the train sound and create the uh, feeling of being scared. Uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, you know, create the space uh, because we are using multi-channel audio. Uh, you kind of lead, especially in VR, we lead uh, with the sound where the the uh, viewer should be looking at. It's, uh, we don't realize it or naturally that uh, if we don't hear the sound, we don't have a cue where to where to uh, put our attention to. Right? In this case, if it's something. Uh, the sound happens on the right side, you turn your head automatically because, because you want to see what's happening. So in VR, when you are submerged in this uh, environment, this is, uh, this is what happens. Right. How about you, Rod? Do you have any comments on the soundtrack or using yeah, the, sound? Uh... From so we wrote the songs together, and um, as I said, the, the long song in the middle is based on Prometheus. It was really fun to write. Um, and I had previously collaborated with Devil and Unferth on a couple of films, and I picked up on this uh, speaking clock uh, concept from a previous work we did. And then we started reworking that with vocalists uh, in uh, Louisville which was uh, a very fascinating structure of work, you know, this language with, it's a clock that keeps trying to say what the time is, but it keeps getting it wrong and wronger and more wrong and more wrong and it splinters and it comes back on itself. And the film, we wanted to have that experience. And there's lots of times where that these become a thread and it keep pulling, pulling the piece back like your cord in a wheel. So there's the songs, the song elements, the train elements, uh, the beaconing sounds that keep coming around and just kind of wrapping you back and wrapping you back. So that, that feeling that you're continually, in a sense, uh, spinning um, as, uh, in a sense, uh, 
uh, we all are without grasping all of the problems around us. Um, so uh, the sound, there's lots of little elements, surprises worked in like that with the sound that is tied to small triggers, uh, certain odd things happening in tunnels, uh, the transformation of people as they move from uh, color to black and white or from looking normal into cartoon form. And it's, or it's all in, in, really all of these different things are beaconing, uh, um, are, t uh, are triggered also in the sound. And we worked on that back and forth, uh, which is a wonderful process. Exactly, thank you. And how well was it like to work, having in mind you would be working for dome-like architecture or for very particular way of perceiving your work? Because both the modes of perceiving, both VR and the dome is immersive, but in different ways. So how was it, you know, thinking of it from the very beginning? That's right, they, they, they are really different. And this was true with sound as well as the image. We, we designed everything in an 8K uh, 3D, which created a huge um, challenge at the time and uh, with a tremendous amount of layering. And the idea was to feel like you're traveling through space and the clarity or detail for that is so, fits so well with a dome or planetarium setting or 360 cinema setting. And there's also something I'd made, I've made lots in several other VR works and uh, found with one as a piece I did called Hearts and Minds on interrogation practices in the Iraq war. And that there's also something very important about sharing certain kinds of experiences together and, and being in an audience where you can respond to each other. Um, and this particular work, um, because of the, the way the music and the, these sort of quite intense periods, quite, and that feeling of dislo location, dislocation, I wanted to have that, see how that works as a group setting. I explored that in other works where actually audiences move around in the space while it's happening. And that's very different from the smaller headset pieces. Um, so it, exactly as we're developing, we're then thinking, well, how can we, which bits would work also in headsets? Because it became, you know, it's clear that the dominant VR market right now is in wearing head mounted displays. Um, and meanwhile, f you know, 45, 50 minute experience, in a dome is a very different thing and being able to uh, have things spin around uh, it, around you and be bigger than you for issues that are bigger than you. Um, I, I think that's rewarding and, and it's just also resolution. Um, thinking of sound in ambisonic versus 5.1 surround is also quite different. Uh, I think Christoph can probably address that too. Well, I think the biggest difference between those two mediums is the intimacy. Uh, that in VR you are really lonely and uh, you know you can take it for 10 minutes but taking it for 45 is much more difficult and uh, and it's just physical with the headsets that we have right now it's just kind of you you get physically tired while in a planetarium it's a it's a spectacular every time I am in planetarium not not, not only watching our film but watching anything it's just such a great experience of being surrounded by virtual space that uh, uh, that uh, I certainly is a preferable, pre preferable uh, experience for me. Uh, it also is much more comfortable experience, uh, uh, but um, you, you don't have that many details. Uh, you cannot see that many details, you cannot hear that many details because on the other hand, uh, with the, in the VR, your sound is right there with you. So you have to work very hard on uh, on uh, uh, making sure that this the sound is uh, uh, has its own space also in VR. So we spend a lot, I spend a lot of time trying to imitate the spaces that in which the the protagonists were uh, were. You know whether, whether it was a, a cave or a house or outside the world where there's a rain. So so there's a lot of uh, detail paid. Uh, I paid a lot of attention to these details uh, of uh, of the locations. Okay, thank you. And uh, we have been speaking a lot about, uh, let's say, the medium and the form, and may also ask about uh, the content. Why do you think finding a key to time is so important for the character Tanek? And why the story is based on looking for this key to time? 
Uh, that's a very uh, good question. It has lots of different uh, hidden aspects to it as well. Uh, one is uh, from the beginning where I was very interested in these different devices of time and how we construct even this notion of a sort of uh, the, the world where it's heading and uh, climate change is tied up to certain constructs of time that are tied to the Industrial Revolution and all of the things we do destroying the world in time. Uh, taking time outside of ourselves um, as this uh, mechanized structure the in, from the invention of universal times and assembly lines onto the, the sense of the instant time of the internet. Um, and how do we grasp control if we can't grasp control of our sense of time? That is, uh, create a more cohesive relationship between the inner self and the outer world. Uh, but when this machine develops time outside of us, we lose a bit of our self, our control to that machine. We have all these internal constructs of time that are, in a way, digested from, from the earliest moments of our lives, internalized, that are from, not from within, but from, from outside, and are from this whole mechanism, this whole system that we're part of. So we listed all sorts of different ways those systems work. And... Um, her hand, um, in a way, destroyed by this time machine gone wrong by, in a way, a scientific error, becomes, in a way, a, a foil for the sense of trying to travel through in some other form. There are obviously uh, other little jokes. Mulholland Drive, for example, the key in Mulholland Drive is one of the, the jokes, which is also a time key. Um, and there's other jokes that run through Metropolis, which is also very uh, obsessed with time and the machines that mark time and uh, lots of play with, with, with that. And we try to make that sense of time very visceral, both through the images and the sound. You're in, in spaces that are very tiny and very huge, in the middle of a clock, in the middle of machines, and then thrown out across a, a vast environment where, you know, what is time when you talk about space? And yet, when you're right there in the clock and this pendulum's hitting you, you have a very a physical experience of it. Okay, thank you. How about you, Christoph? Can you comment on? I mean, it's a lot of. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, I think it's a, there's a lot of uh, also tied up into into working with memory. Uh, memory is uh, a lot. You know, dreams and memory uh, are kind of based on our memories, and memories are, allow us to travel through time because you, we can go back into into the words that, are, that that were happening and there are different triggers sound can be a trigger you know smell can be a trigger so i think it's a lot of uh, a lot of us uh, connected into this uh, uh, idea also you know what would be if if something else happened and what are the options uh, what what are going to be results of our decisions right now i think this is uh, uh, you know there's a lot of symbolism that the lot uh, lot design in the film uh, that uh, I think he is the best to speak uh, speak about. You know, it's, uh, I think it's great that it's so multi-layered. Uh, that's nice you bring up the notion of time too, because we'll be actually looking at a video sequence in just a moment. Uh, so coming near the end of the talk time, to uh, be in the clock with the, with speaking clock with a, a short extract called "Meet Me at the Station." Um, yes. And this notion Thank of you. memory. And time and timelessness is also, I think, very important to that. What's his internal time? The world we travel in inside versus outside. Okay, so thank you for everything you have told us about the projects. I think we need to learn more maybe from the samples you have provided for us. That, uh, Great. That, that sounds good. Maybe, uh, you know, if somebody has questions, uh, maybe that's a good moment to answer them if there are any. Yes. If you have any questions. And while you're thinking about that, let me sit, tell you we're about to, I'm about to post a link. And once I post a link, the thing is streaming uh, this kind of video on uh, through the uh, Zoom isn't uh, effective, it just is too stuttery. So once you're on the link, she'll be thrown out to watch it in uh, uh, Vimeo. So we can maybe take some questions before that. We're going to have to unmute everybody before we do that. Um, other, otherwise, uh, they won't be able to ask questions. So, um, whoever's the host, I can't do it. I think we can unmute ourselves.
okay if you can unmute yourself sometimes it can be hi rod this is mark williams uh very excited to see the project and uh I'll, i'm sure i'll have more questions after after we see some bits but could you talk uh, a little more about the challenge of working in 8k that sounds really quite daunting uh, for many reasons uh yeah it was crazy um the challenge i must say at the time even more so because we started uh, a couple of years ago at least and um the uh the so there's several different challenges one is we were creating uh frames uh blender frames at, at uh, 60 frames a second uh, that we would match the action in the green screen. So we had a very heavy, large uh, file uh, to deal with um, frame by frame. Um, so we created kind of mockups, trying to minimize that, that we could use to uh, put the action on. So in shooting on the green screen, you have the actors performing uh, in this big studio. It's where they shot uh, Loving Vincent. It's a huge green screen studio lots of people in there. Uh, we, we taped out the rooms and the doors and everything in the space so that the actors could move. And then we had our, our frames, mock-up frames. Um, and, but we, had, we, had the, uh, we were shooting with basically two ganged FF7s to, uh, that we were, had measured the lens, lens length to shoot in the distance we were at. So we were work, working with, I think, a, a 50 and a 70 millimeter. And, um, and then we, um, so we could set each of these people into this space. That, um, of course, it required a, also a tremendous amount of work at 60 frames a second in uh, 8K just to uh, do the chroma keying and get all those masks done. And then we had these figures to put on and put those together. Uh, that was the uh, incredibly time consuming. Then we created animations on top of that. Um, now, the outside scenes, some of those were shot with an InstaPro, so that was much, much more straightforward, except we were trying to layer these two things together. And then it just got into huge file issues because we had such a, a large amount of material. And then we had special effects on that. Uh, all these, uh, the, the uh, water sequences, the lightning bolts, the uh, different, uh, um, lots of, there's lots of different little special effects and working with a color, with different color and black and white tints. So yes, all of that was a, a thing about space management and we had to break down into very uh, small segments. So there's a bit of a mystery. So that encouraged again, a kind of combinatory logic of working in, in little segments and trying to work how they bounce back and forth and building out different parts, which was a really uh, challenging but interesting way. Lots of headaches of, of uh, things crashing uh, as we were doing it, uh, primarily building in After Effects and um, having very long render times. And some renders took as, as long as, I think two weeks was the longest render I had uh, churning away on a couple hard drives. And so I had this very technical explanation, but uh, definitely an emotional one as well. That's great, thank you. I found it interesting how you um, you said you had the actors speak first in an animation frequently that is that's the, the process and then the animators come in and hear the actors and how they presented the character and then they create the nuances and the characters around the audio. Yeah, that's interesting. My experience, I had um, previously done some radio dramas and in the sense of old world, new world and working with also silent cinema motifs or early cinema motifs. Um, I was wanting to create that sense of sort of you, it feels synced and then doesn't feel synced. Um, and you have the excessive drama that the uh, of radio a drama that is and working so we work with these, uh, you know, great opera singers. And so their voice was so rich and deep. And then you kind of worked with these cartoons. Cause I took the actors and I, I think at times I made them in just 2D cartoon characters. 
uh, after the, you know, I flattened them out and stuff. So we had this disjunct that was really fun to play with, which is exactly, it's like, it's like that graphic novel or cartoon experience animation, but it's also draws on the radio show and the sense of performing opera, although it's not opera style of music, it was with uh, performers who perform opera. So they have, um, you know, in a way, some of that resonance. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, the, uh, I wouldn't, I can't stress it enough that the, the uh, opera singers who happen to be also fantastic actors uh, really give life to all the dialogues and the story. And um, yeah, we were very, very happy and thankful that we could have worked with them. It was interesting to, to do everything uh, kind of remotely because uh, um, Rod was in uh, Philadelphia while I was recording with them in Louisville. And, uh, we, you know, it's modern world, we can make it work. Uh, distance means nothing, theoretically, unless there is a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we can take one last question if uh, there's one, and then we'll, uh, we're posting, I think uh, Sabrina is just about to post a video uh, to the chat space. Uh, Sabrina, are you uh, able to do that? Yeah, it's in the, it should be in the chat right now. We can maybe Great. post it also to Facebook, um, uh, under the Facebook video. Yes, there is a and link. And okay. Everyone see the link? Yep. Great. So um, I think this is, we just let everyone uh, go and uh, have a screening. It takes 10 minutes and that, uh, um, do we continue the chat or we'll close off now, Holly? Um, I guess we could continue the chat for those that want to um, come back. Other, otherwise, uh, thank everyone for coming and everybody on Facebook also because we were live streaming it. And thank you for doing it. And people that want to come back, can come back for a short chat or comments. That'd be great. So it's uh, 10 minutes and um, we'll turn off our videos and uh, pop back on the chat page if you like at the end for a few minutes and uh, we'll wrap on the hour. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to all of you.